Hello everyone, this is Dr. Lamphere, and today we're going to be talking about theory and the role that theory plays in social research. Theory provides us our backcloth and our rationale for the research that we conduct as social researchers. So what is a theory? A theory is an explanation of observed regularities that we see in the world. A theory is a statement of relationships between variables. In its most simplest form, your theory has to have variables and it has to state the nature of the relationship between them. What is not a theory? A theory is not a guess or a hunch. Sometimes we'll use the term, we'll say I, I have a, a theory about why something is working and what we're doing is we're making guesses and hunches and guesses and hunches aren't statements about the nature of relationships between variables. And theories connect to social research in a couple of ways. Theories help to inform the type of research that we're going to do. Sometimes we use theories as the basis for our research and then sometimes our research ends up resulting in theories from our results. We often use theory daily when we're thinking about how the world works around us. So for example, if you ever are sitting around and thinking to yourself, why have U.S. divorce rates dropped in recent years? You're kind of using a theory. But our everyday theories are often incomplete and they're limited. They're fragmented versions of what a full social theory actually is. It's important that we talk about the parts of a theory and break it down first thing we need to talk about are concepts. Concepts are the building blocks of a theory. In the natural sciences, we often use things like formulas as our concepts, like Einstein would use. But in the social sciences, we aren't using formulas. We're using words or symbols that we use to represent some type of mental image. So things like crime, gender. Those are all things that we use in the social sciences as different concepts when we're building our theories. And then sometimes we take these concepts and we have to bring them together to make concept clusters and I will, I will explain that a little later on in the PowerPoint. So when we take the concepts that we are building our theory out of and we specify precisely what we mean when we say we are using a particular term, what we are doing is something called conceptualization. And I will give you an example of conceptualization in the next slide. But the purpose of a conceptualization is to provide us with a working definition for our research. It helps us focus our observations by telling us what we will study and what we will not be studying. So a key concept that we might use in our theories, our social theories, is that of socioeconomic status. And there are many ways that one can measure socioeconomic status. So it would be important to tell somebody exactly what you mean when you say socioeconomic status. We have obvious measures like somebody's income, but is socioeconomic status really just about income? For example, in 2014, the poverty poverty guidelines said that a household of one person would be living below the poverty line if they made less than $11,670. Given that the audience for this PowerPoint is mainly college students, I'm guessing there are many of you that were below the poverty line last year, but you wouldn't classify yourself as being of a low socioeconomic status, I'm guessing, because there are a lot of other things that go into your socioeconomic status, such as the assets you might own, the type of debt that you might have, your education level, your occupation level, the house you drive, the car, or the house you live in, the car you drive, the type of clothing that you wear, the type of language that you use, all of these things can make up somebody's socioeconomic status. So it's important when you have a concept like socioeconomic status that you conceptualize it and tell other people exactly what it is that you mean when you say socioeconomic status. That's, that's the only way that people can really replicate your exact, exact way of measurement. 
So moving on from conceptualization is the idea of operationalization. And operationalization is a further specification where you talk about the operations that you will undertake to measure a concept. It's the specifics on how you will measure a concept and its variables. And really there's no right, right answer when it comes to operationalization. It just matters how you are doing it in a particular study or how you have, def you have conceptually defined something. So for example, socioeconomic status. I might choose to obtain this information through a question or through a series of questions. So for example, if I define socioeconomic status as being income and level of education, then I would ask the question, how, what was your household income in the past 12 months and how many people were in your household to gauge their income? And what is the highest level of school you have completed to gauge education? Again, the questions that I asked, I only asked because I decided to conceptualize socioeconomic status as being income and education level. If I had conceptualized socioeconomic status as being income and type of debt, debt held, then I would want to ask questions about the type of debt that was being held as well as income. So how you operationalize depends completely upon how you conceptualize something. Another key part of a theory beyond concepts are assumptions. So what is an assumption? It's a statement about the nature of things that are not necessarily observable or testable. It's statements about the nature of human beings and our social reality. For example, in the rational choice theory, a popular theory in criminology, the key assumptions are that human beings are rational actors, rationality involves an ends means calculation, and that people choose behavior based on rational calculations looking to maximize their pleasure and minimize their pain. So these are all key assumptions that this theory makes, kind of going into their research, they already are making an assumption about he, the nature of human beings and their rationality and how, the choices that they make to maximize their pleasure and minimize their pain. Another key part of a theory involves relationships. Relationships specify how our assumptions and our concepts relate to one another. Relationships give us the why of why the relationship exists. So here's an, an example of an application of theory and research. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on teenage sexting, which is when teenagers send inappropriate um, nude, semi-nude, or sexually suggestive messages, pictures, videos to each other via cell phone. The theoretical framework that I used to study, to study sexting was Gottfriedson and Hershey's 1990 General Theory of Crime. The assumptions of the general theory of crime are that the single most important factor behind crime and analogous behaviors, which are behaviors that are similar to criminal behavior, is individual lack of self-control. And that criminal acts are short-lived, immediately gratifying, easy, simple, and exciting. The ability to delay short-term desire is referred to as self-control. And that lack of self-control can be traced back to childhood and that parenting is, parenting is consistent through the life course. The relationships in the general theory of crime are that the concept of poor parental management leads to low self-control and that low self-control leads to increased propensity for criminal behavior. The key concepts of this theory are self-control, which is conceptualized as impulse is being impulsive, having a preference for simple tasks, risk-seeking behavior, physical activity, a preference for physical activity, being short-tempered, and being self-centered. How I would measure self-control is the Grasmick et al. 1993 scale, which measures all six dimensions of self-control that I have conceptualized. Another key concept in the general theory of crime is parental management. It is conceptualized as monitoring of children's behavior, recognizing bad behavior when, it, when they see it, and correcting said bad behavior. To measure this, I use Gib, Gibbs, Giever, and Martin's 1998 parental management scale. The crime that we were looking at was sexting, and I conceptualized that as sending or receiving nude, semi-nude, or sexually suggestive text or picture video messages via cell phone, 
and because at the time I was doing the research there weren't any surveys out about it I used an original survey to measure my my con my conceptualized variable something that's important for us to understand is the aspect of a theory or the direction of theorizing the question kind of becomes what can comes first a theory or the research to back up a theory one type of reasoning is called the deductive reasoning approach this is working from the general to the specific we call this the top-down approach this is where you start with a theory and move towards empirical evidence to support your theory then you test your ideas about how the world works against the hard data that you collect so you start with a theory move to hypothesis and observations to ultimately confirm your theory the top-down approach the other approach that we take is theory building or the inductive research approach this is where we say we're working from specific observations to broader generalizations and theories we call this the bottom up bottom up approach or if you ever hear of a theory being referred to as a grounded theory this is what we mean and you begin with only a topic and a few vague concepts you observe and examine evidence and refine your concepts along the way to create empirical generalizations and then you identify preliminary theoretical relationships based on what you what you have observed so you start with observation and move your way up to theory inductive reasoning is really good when you're you have open-ended questions or when you're doing exploratory research where you really aren't too sure what it is that you want to find deductive reasoning is more narrow and we use it more to test or confirm our hypotheses many researchers might use inductive and deductive reasoning in the course of one subject and for an example of this we'll look at Emil Durkheim's suicide the official stats on suicide um, in the official statistics on stu suicide that Durkheim was studying he noted that Protestant countries had higher rates of suicide compared to Catholics and so he inductively created his theory of enemies in suicide based on his observations his theoretical interpretations led Durkheim to deduce that to use deductive reasoning to create more hypotheses and collect more observations so he was using inductive reasoning to create his theory then deductive reasoning to test his theory theories can take on different levels so it's important that we talk about the different levels that a theory can take and how this applies to research we have micro level theories which are theories at the individual level and that focuses on the smallest level of interactions between human beings for example Marx and McDermott's 1996 balancing roles and identities they look at how people balance roles across multiple roles across their life and they found that lower depression levels were associated with higher levels of self-esteem the next level of theory is the meso level theory or group theory which is where you're looking at so organizations social movements or communities for example Mesner's 2009 study where he looked at interactions among parent volunteers in children's sports leagues and found that gender boundaries and hierarchies are were perpetuated by adults who run such leagues but he was looking at the at the groups of people rather than individuals and then the biggest level of theory that we have are macro level of theories which are our cultural and our social institution level theories for example Frank Camp and Boucher's 2010 worldwide changes in laws regulating sex the theory they have uh, regarding worldwide laws regulating sex they did a comparison of multiple countries and they found that laws have shifted in focusing from protecting large entities um, like like families to now protecting individuals so that would be an example of a macro level theory because they were looking at cultures in across uh, many regions of the world so theories can take on both prediction and explanation a theoretical explanation gives you gives you a logical argument and tells you why something is an, is occurring and makes connections among concepts theoretical ex explanation is one of the more popular uses of theory 
ordinary explanations make something clear, but the illustrations are that are in, that are often intelligible. Some theories, though, are used to predict, and that's a statement that something will occur. It's easier to predict than it is to explain something. One type of explanations that theory can make are causal explanations. Look, that's looking at the cause-effect relationship between a variable. Different types of causal explanations. One is qualitative. That's where you look at a few cases and you make your explanation about the causal relationship based on logic and it's ne you use necessary and sufficient causes. Quantitative is more popula population based where you're looking at a large number of cases and you focus on regularities and patterns within the population. You're looking at aggregate or group explanations. And we have three criteria for causality. These are things that have to be in place in order for us to say a change in our independent variable caused a change in our dependent variable. One is temporal ordering. That means the cause has to come before and the effect in time. So if I'm going to say that somebody's mental health, their psych mental psychology was a result of their criminal behavior, their problems with their mental health would need to come before the, the crime in time. Covariation or association, you need to have empirically correlated variables, meaning they must occur together. So something like an increase in age results in a decrease in crime is an example of covariation. Or we could say something along the lines of an increase in chocolate will result in an increase in happiness. It doesn't matter if the variables are both positive in their if are both positive, are both negative, or if one's positive and one's negative. All you need for covariation to occur is that there has to be a change in one variable um, results in a change in the other variable. And finally, we have non-spuriousness or other plausible alternatives. That means that you don't have some type of third variable that's explaining the nature of the relationship between your variables. And an example of this that we use is um, that we know during the summertime months, we see an increase in the rate of sexual assaults, but we also see an increase in the rate of ice cream sales. So one might conclude if you just saw that data that ice cream, uh, that increased ice cream eating results in increased sexual assaults. Now, in that case, we do have temporal ordering. The ice cream comes before the sexual assaults. We have covariation, a change in, the, in sexual assaults, uh, an increase in ice cream resulted in an increase in sexual assaults. But what, what was really uh, going on and causing the increase in sexual assaults was a third variable, and that would be the weather and people being outside in the nice weather and having more opportunities for sexual assaults to happen to them. So the first stage in our research process is creating research questions. That is a question that you seek to answer by collecting and analyzing data. Essentially, it is a hypothesis asked in the form of a question. How do you come up with research questions? Well, you might make your research questions based on theory. You might make your research questions based on other people's research, or it might be out of some type of personal interest that you have. You might brainstorm, and you typically brainstorm several research questions, and then you will pick your favorite ones in order to do the research with. In real life, we have to evaluate the feasibility of our research. Can it be done? And to look at the, can it be done, we have to look at things like, do we have the time to answer our question? Do we have the money, the resources, the knowledge, and the access to the population that we need in order to answer our research questions? We have to also ask ourselves, are these questions important? And are they informed by theory and research? So examples of, what, of research questions might include something like, why do some sex offenders recidivate while others don't? And does cap capital punishment deter future crime? A hypothesis is a clear formal statement that presents the expected relationship between an independent and a dependent variable. A problem cannot be scientifically solved until it has been reduced to hypothesis form. And some things about hypotheses, one, they have to be testable. They have to be testable so that they can be falsified or verified. 
Hypotheses need to be neither too specific nor too general. They need to have a prediction of consequences. And hypotheses are valuable even if we prove them false. Sometimes we find we have a hypothesis about something, we do our research and our research studies don't back up our, our hypotheses. That doesn't mean that we had a bad hypothesis. That just means that we got an explanation that we weren't looking for. And that, that hypothesis is still useful because it's just a, as important to know what we don't know about research as it is to know what we do know about research. So there are different types of hypotheses and it's important that you understand the difference between the types of hypotheses. One type of hypotheses that we have we refer to as the null hypotheses. It's te usually designated in research by an HO or an HN. And in its ma most basic form, our null hypothesis says there is not a relationship between two variables. And then on the other hand, we have researcher alternative hypotheses, which are designated as H1 or HA. And are in their most basic form, they say that there is a relationship between variables. And the relationship between the variables, your hypothesis may be directional and specify the nature of relationship between variables. So saying something like an increase in chocolate will result in an increase in happiness, that would be an example of, an, of a directional hypothesis. Or they could be non-directional and just simply state that there is a relationship between variables. For example, if we had a clinical drug, drug company that was do, comparing a new drug with an existing drug, they might have a null hypothesis, the HO, that there is no difference between the two drugs. A non-directional research hypothesis would be that there is a difference between the two drugs, and a directional hypothesis would be that the new drug is better than the current drug on average. Here's an example of theory, research questions, and hypotheses all put together. So we have our theory, the general theory of crime, which states that there is a relationship between self-control and crime. So a research question based on the theory is, what is the relationship between self-control and crime? And our hypotheses, a null would be, there is no relationship between self-control and criminal behavior. A directional hypothesis would be that a decrease in self-control will result in an increase in criminal behavior. And a non-directional research hypothesis would just simply state that self-control is related to criminal behavior.